Welcome to Unit 3, Lesson 1 um, in Texas Government. This is um, a chapter over the Texas Constitution. And um, the Texas Constitution is one of my favorite things to talk about. I'm not really sure why, um, but it probably has something to do with it's a, it's a very specific set of rules. It has evolved um, and shown it kind of shows how Texas has evolved um, over the years. And um, so we will talk a little bit about history and we will talk about the provisions um, in uh, Texas law. We will give a kind of a broad overview of the three different branches of government. And then, the, then unit three, lesson two, three, and four are over the specific branches of the Texas government. So we're going to talk about um, the history of Texas Constitution, the structure of the Texas Constitution, and then how we amend the Constitution, which is something we do quite a lot, as you will see. So let's talk about the first, um, the first Constitution, 1835. Remember where we are. Um, the Revolutionary War ended. Texas is now free from Mexico's rule. And in 1836, um, Texas drafted their first constitution. This constitution was the Constitution of the Republic of Texas. It was heavily influenced by Spanish and Mexican law, obviously, because that's what we knew. That's the people that were living in the Texas territory, the Republic of Texas, had grown up with um, the the tenets of Spanish and Mexican law. Things that we've talked about, we may have talked about before, like um, property rights for women is something that came from the Spanish, um, the Spanish law. The um, Constitution was also influenced by English common law. What common law is, is just judge-made law. So basically, it's not the written down law. It's the, the law that um, kind of evolves through the court system. And then the US Constitution. Um, obviously, if we wanted to be part of the United States, we um, had checked out their constitution and seen you know, kind of what was in that constitution and decided that was something we wanted to be a part of. In 1845, when Texas was admitted to the United States, remember there's a little bit of a lag time there, but in 1845, when we were admitted to the United States, that was the first constitution of, the, um, of Texas as a state part of the United States. Um, it was a long document, um, very long document. It was anti-corporate, meaning that it um, did not favor corporations, favored more of um, protection of the individual. And it yielded a long ballot, which means that um, there were a lot of decisions that voters had to make. We elected a lot of different people um, because of what the Constitution provided. And so um, that's, you know, kind of the beginning of our long ballot. Remember that the Civil War was from 1861 to 1865. And in 1861 is when um, Texas withdrew from the United States and became part of the Confederate States. And so, as you can imagine, um, Texas's constitution that was um, making it part of the Confederacy prohibited the emancipation of slaves. So it was pro-slavery, um, saying that you not only should you not um, emancipate your slaves, but you could not. It was against the Constitution to do that. The um, Civil War ends in 1865, and remember, we're under a um, 
period of federal rule because um, during Reconstruction, the, the winning side, um, the North had to make sure that the South did not just go straight back into um, slavery and their slavery ways. And so in 1866, <clears throat> um, the, uh, there was the next constitution that um, nullified secession. So saying that, um, you know, basically we take back withdrawing from the United States and we want back in. Um, it abolished slavery, which is directly opposite of the, the Constitution before it, and it only lasted one year. And then in 1869, um, after federal military rule um, was over, um, and we were, you know, back to making our own constitutions. Um, the um, state instituted um, a constitution, the Constitution of 1869, that really centralized power in um, a strong governor and um, was, you know, very... Um, put a lot of power and a lot of decision-making ability in that governor. And so that was 1869. And then um, in 1875, there was a constitutional convention of about 90 people. And that is when um, Texas enacted the Constitution of 1875, which is the constitution that we have had ever since. So, um, We've had the same, you know, we had, we had quite a few turnovers there right at the beginning, but now we have not had a new constitution since 1875, which is a good deal. Um, we'll talk a little bit about it later, but lots of amendments to the constitution, but um, the constitution of 1875 um, was enacted by Democrats. Remember, Texas was, was previously um, pro-democracy or pro-democratic pro state. Um, the Democrats wanted to strike at the heart of a big government associated with the Reconstruction era, which if you're reading that and you're thinking that doesn't really, you know, limited government sounds like more of a Republican Party thing. You're right. Um, the parties have kind of flip-flopped and switched. I don't mean flip-flopped as in um, they're wishy-washy, but they have switched um, kind of their ideologies or their um, their views on certain issues over the years. So at the time of 1875, Democrats were the ones in charge in Texas, but they said um, they wanted to have less big government. Um, and so what they did in order to do that was they wanted to limit the power of the um, people who were in charge. They cut their salaries for officials that were serving in the government. They put limits on property taxes so the government could not just um, decide what our property taxes were and willy-nilly without you know, consultation of, of the people. Um, they restricted state borrowing so that the officials, the public officials could not just borrow on behalf of the state um, without approval. Again, limited power for officials, especially the governor. So we went from our previous um, constitution that had a very strong governor who had a lot of power and decision-making ability to a very weak governor, which is what we have now. Um, the governor was limited to a two-year term at that time. We'll talk about it in a little bit, but that's not what it is now. Um, there were a whole lot more elected officials, attorney general, state judges. Um, that's something different um, about Texas than some other states is that we elect everybody. Um, a lot of states have, have an appointment system, at least a limited appointment system. Um, and Texas, basically we elect every single person. Um, it limited 
um, legislative meetings and legislative power. We'll talk about that in a minute too, but it really did um, give less power to the legislature to just um, kind of take over. Um, and, and it also de-incentivized being career politicians. Um, if you're, you know, it gave legislatures, um, legislators, lots of extra time to do, to have a real job um, other than a, a state legislature. Um, and then it gave the local and the county governments more power. So again, you see this decentralization, um, giving more power to the people and it established public schools only if local government made sure that the schools were segregated. Um, again, this is one of our things that's not very um, great part of Texas history, but we wrote in our Constitution of 1875 that um, only time you could have public schools is if the um, government made sure they were segregated. So let's talk about the Texas Constitution as it relates to or compares to other constitutions. The Texas Constitution is long. It is 11 times longer than the United States Constitution. And it is the second longest um, constitution in the United States. It has 88,500 words, which is a lot of words. Um, just kind of for reference, when you read a novel, um, novelists usually shoot to have about 100,000 words in their novels. And so it's a long document and it has 498 amendments, which is a lot of amendments. Um, it's, it's really just, um, it's, it's a very onerous document. Um, what are the pros and cons to having a long, um, constitution or a very specific constitution. Um, the con is it's it's too big to read. Most people don't just sit down and, and read the Texas Constitution and so therefore they don't really know what's in there. Um, a, like you can print the the federal constitution in a short little booklet and carry it around in your pocket. Um, the Texas Constitution you could not do that. Um, and the good thing is um, it doesn't leave, you know, really any wiggle room for um, another faction to come in and um, propose rules that don't have, you know, that are not addressed in the Constitution and, and try to take over um, because the Constitution, the Texas Constitution is so specific that it, it sets forth what kinds of um, things are okay and not okay in very specific um, circumstances. So the Bill of Rights um, is the first um, 10 amendments to the United States Constitution. Um, it is applied to the states um, through the 14th Amendment. So in, or, in, in addition to Texas being governed by the Texas Constitution, the Texas also is governed by the U.S. Constitution, specifically the Bill of Rights, um, which sets forth, we'll talk about them in, in detail in the next couple of slides, but sets forth very specific um, provisions. The Texas is also governed by statutory law, which is written down laws. So um, it is, you know, kind of how many deer can you shoot um, in a year? That's not in the Constitution, but that's in Texas statute. Um, and then also Texas is governed by common law, which is law that's made by judges. And that's not judges writing down um, you know, a provision like you can't shoot more than 10 deer a year or something like that. But it is um, the interpretation of the provisions in the Constitution or the provisions in statutory law, um, and they become law. So when, when Texas judges um, speak, it has the same force and effect as, um, as law. 
So we are going to kind of dip into the federal constitution for just a minute. A minute. This is not a um, federal government class, and so we're not going to spend a ton of time on it. But the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution applies the Bill of Rights to the states. And um, it does this by saying that no state shall deny life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Um, so when you see that the state is denying someone of life in the death sentence um, or death penalty, um, liberty, putting somebody in jail, or property, um, denying, you know, taking property from somewhere, someone else, um, the state can do that. They just have to have um, given the person who is is having life, liberty, or property taken from them due process of law. And due process of law is something that is talked about a lot by lawyers and in law school. But what it just means is you have to have some sort of a um, you have to have some rules in place. So due process of law just means that the government can't come in and like a king just seize all your land. There has to be some rules in place and there has to be, um, you know, an opportunity for you to be heard and for there to be some kind of a procedure to appeal um, the taking, things like that. So um, that is what the 14th Amendment says. Um, the Due Process Clause. It says also that states um, must respect the protection of the U.S. Bill of Rights. So you can't, you know, a state can't um, make a law that is in conflict with um, the Bill of Rights and can't contradict the federal constitution. I mean, that's in the hierarchy of constitutions, the federal constitution is first, then the state constitution, and then you trickle down to the um, lower level governments. And so um, you can't, the, the state constitution cannot contradict the federal constitution. So let's go through the Bill of Rights specifically, because I think this is really important to know. These are in the U.S. Constitution, but they are applied to the states. So they are the law of Texas as well as the law of um, the United States. So the First Amendment, you have heard, I'm sure, the First Amendment talked about because that is free speech. Um, the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So the important parts there, um, Congress and also a state cannot establish a religion or prohibit someone from exercising their religion freely. Um, the, the state and um, Congress cannot abridge or prevent free speech, and they cannot prevent a free press, um, meaning they have to let the press print what the press wants to print. Um, the, the state or the federal government cannot um, prohibit people from peaceably assembling. Um, the key word there is peaceably. And um, people can, can petition the government for a redress of their grievances. People can complain to the government and complain about the government. Um, this is not a, a place to live where you can't say something bad about um, the president or the governor or um, the state officials um, for fear of being locked up. Um, now, there's definitely some loopholes. You can't have a very specific threat to kill someone and um, that be allowed and not, you know, not, um, not punished. But you can say, I hate this law. This law is stupid. And the governor was stupid for making, you know, for signing this law. The legislature was stupid for 
um, drafting the law and I hate all the judges that enforce the law and that's okay. Um, okay, second amendment is um, the right to bear arms. So um, there's a lot of, of litigation. There's a lot of discussion about the second amendment, both um, on a state level and a uh, federal level and different states vary on what they interpret, um, but they, they do have to um, follow the federal interpretation that a well-regulated militia being necessary to, to the security of a free state, the right of people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So a lot of loaded phrases in there. Um, I guess no pun intended, but that's pretty clever, huh? Um, a lot of loaded of phrases about, um, you know, what is infringing on the right to keep and bear arms. What does the right to keep and bear arms mean? Does that mean that I get to have one gun? Does it mean I get to have an AR-15 or 25 AR-15s? Um, does it mean I have to be part of a well-regulated militia? What in the world is a well-regulated militia? Anyway, lots of questions. Um, some of which have been answered by the Supreme Court and some of which have not. But this applies to um, the states as well as um, the federal government. So this means that a state, let's just say, you know, like Montana, couldn't say nobody here can have a gun because the Second Amendment applies to the, um, the states as well as the federal government. Um, the Third Amendment is um, no soldier shall in a time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. So basically, the state government um, cannot force you to house either a state militia member or um, a federal um, soldier in your house. Um, Fourth Amendment. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. So Fourth Amendment is a big deal in criminal law because it prevents um, unreasonable searches and seizures by the government and it means that um, the government has to have a warrant in most cases um, to come and search your property so um, now we'll talk about there's you know a lot of kind of carve outs and caveats to this but in general um, the police cannot just be driving down the street be they the state police or the um, you know the federal marshals cannot be just driving down the street and um, look at my property and decide they want to go in and rifle around um, unless they have a warrant um, because I have a Fourth Amendment right both from the federal government and the state government to be secure in my person, houses, papers, and effects from unreasonable searches and seizures. Fifth Amendment is, um, you know, when people say they plead the fifth, that means that you don't have to testify about um, against yourself. So it says no person shall be held to answer for a capital, capital meaning where the death penalty is um, an option for punishment. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land of, or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in a time of war or public danger, nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So there's a lot in the Fifth Amendment. The first clause is if you're going to be um, charged with a capital offense, meaning an offense where um, the death penalty 
can be um, imposed. You have to have an indictment um, of a grand jury, meaning that you um, have to have kind of a neutral third party um, to say that, yes, there's enough evidence for this case to go forward. But there's an exception. If it's a time of war and you're in the military, um, then that, you know, there is an exception for that. Um, the second clause is we can't be um, subject to the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy. So what that means is that um, the federal government and the state government cannot charge me with um, murdering someone. Um, and then if a jury finds me not guilty, that the government can't come back and try me again for that same offense, the same murder, because that's putting me in jeopardy twice. That is making me answer for the same crime twice. Um, the third clause is that in a criminal case, I don't have to be a witness against myself. Um, the, the key there is in a criminal case. So if you are um, char, you know, if you're in court and um, you're fighting with your neighbor over um, whether or not, you know, your tree damaged their house when it was, you know, in your yard and then fell over um, and hit their house, you can't plead the fifth in that case and say that you're not going to testify. Um, because it's not a criminal case. There's no, there's no chance that you might say something that will put you in jail. Um, and then there is also the life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Again, you can't be denied of your life, your liberty, or your property. You can't be thrown in jail. You can't be put to death. Um, you can't have your property taken from you like a fine. Um, without due process of law, meaning a right to complain, a right to have the law followed um, correctly. And then finally, the final um, provision is that um, private property can't be taken for public use without just compensation. And you may be thinking like, well, wait a second, I hear about cases where a farmer has some farmland and the state wants to put a highway through that farmland and so they can just go take that farmland or that um, take the piece of the farmland that they want to build a highway. True, absolutely true they can, but there has to be just compensation. So if the government is going to take um, private property for public use, they have to pay the person who owns the property. I'm sorry, that is not the supremacy clause. That is the 10th Amendment saying that um, if, the, um, if there is a right, um, if there is a power, I'm sorry, that is not um, either delegated to the United States nor prohibited to be, to be given to the states, then it's reserved to the states. So the states are the ones who retain kind of the um, catch all the the rest of the rights if it's not something that's explicitly given to the federal government or um, explicitly prohibited to be given to the states then it is the state's right okay so we talked about how the state um, constitution cannot contradict the federal constitution it can also um, not restrict the rights that are given by the federal constitution. It can broaden the rights of the people, but it can't take some of the rights away that the federal constitution has allowed. Um, we will talk a little bit about, um, there's, you know, places for, like I've mentioned, places for interpretation of the federal constitution. For example, in like the area of education, the federal um, law says that there has to be equal funding for public schools, um, but the states can come in and say, okay, how are we going to interpret this? How are we going to um, define equal in, um, a, in the application of funding to public schools?
if there is a um, place where the federal constitution is silent, then the Texas constitution can offer protections. So things like gender discrimination, not mentioned in the federal constitution. So the state constitution can say whether gender discrimination is prohibited. Um, victims' rights, again, not mentioned. So the state constitution steps in and says what rights victims have. Um, access to public beaches, no imprisonment for debt, um, a homestead exemption. The homestead exemption is something that's a big deal in Texas because it says that the um, state government um, or any of the um, any company cannot um, take your home, your homestead, um, in order to satisfy a debt. Now, you can only have one homestead. You can't have 25 houses and say they're all your homestead. And so, um, you know, as a way to kind of keep um, money and, you know, tied up in those kinds of things so that um, people that are trying to collect debts cannot reach those. You can only have one homestead. And you can um, lose that homestead if it is for the mortgage on that homestead. So if I have a house and um, I have a mortgage on the house and I quit paying my mortgage, then the mortgage company can take my house from me, even if it's my home. Um, but if I have a house and um, I also, um, for example, like I said earlier, like my tree in my yard um, destroys, you know, falls over and destroys my um, neighbor's house. My neighbor sues me and gets a judgment for $300,000 and I can't pay that judgment. Then my neighbor can't say, well, I'll just take your house instead because it's my homestead. Um, monopolies are prohibited by the Texas Constitution. Um, monopolies are when there's um, a segment of um, the market that is controlled by only one company. So think about if we only have one cell phone provider, um, that would be a monopoly. Um, if we only had one electric company um, to choose from, that would be a monopoly. Monopolies are prohibited by the Constitution, by the state Constitution, silent in the federal Constitution. Um, a jury trial before you're committed for a mental illness. So that means if you, um, in Texas, if you are going to be put away in, um, in a home where you can't leave, um, then, and, and because somebody says that you have severe mental illness, then you are entitled to um, a jury trial before you can be um, sent to that home and confined in that home. Um, the Texas Constitution forbids suspending habeas corpus. Um, what habeas corpus is, is just basically you have to um, tell somebody why they're in jail. So if somebody is in jail, um, they can't be in jail for some secret offense or, you know, you can't just throw somebody in jail and say, well, you know what you did. Well, that's not fair. Um, just like the federal constitution talked about, you have a right to be told why you're being arrested. You also have, um, per the Texas constitution, the, the state um, and the government cannot suspend that right. Um, you know, maybe in a extreme circumstance or, or some other um, time of war, something like that. And then finally, the Texas Constitution says that um, wages cannot be garnished except for payment of child support. So um, the, the state government um, has provided that, you know, a company can't just say, OK, fine, I'm just going to garnish your wages to pay for your debt unless that is for um, the payment of child support. And then the state can garnish your wages and they will.
Okay, so we're going to talk about just a little bit about separation of powers and um, the three different governments because, um, I mean, the three different branches of government because the next three lessons are about these specific three branches of government. So we're going to give kind of a broad overview and then um, we'll go into more depth in the next lessons. So, and this is at the state level, remember. So separation of power is included in the state constitution. Um, the first constitution of the United States back, way back as we talked about with the um, black flag with the white star on it, um, the first constitution was provided for a unitary government, meaning that the power was um, concentrated into one, um, one piece of the government. The current constitution has checks and balances, um, has different um, branches of government, different distinct responsibilities of each of those branches. And so the um, separation of power is done in order to limit um, one branch from abusing their power. So that's, that's why it's called a check and a balance. So if the legislative branch tries to abuse their power, then another branch of government can step in and um, prevent that. So let's talk about where we see checks and balances. Um, if the executive branch appoints someone to um, an office, then the legislative branch has to confirm that person. Um, if a law is passed by the legislature, which is what, what the law, what the legislature does, um, then it is interpreted or enforced by the judiciary. So if the legislature um, passes a terrible law, then the judiciary can say, yeah, that law doesn't apply um, because it's terrible and it would deny your rights. Um, laws are passed by the legislature and can be vetoed by the executive. So again, legislature passes a terrible law the governor can look at the law and say, yeah, we're not doing that and can veto the law before it's enacted. Um, the legislature sets judicial salaries, so um, and they can impeach judges. So that means that if judges get out of line um, in their interpretation of laws, then the um, judiciary can impeach them. Um, and also to protect, the executive can appoint a judge to finish a term. So a legislature cannot come in and say, these judges are all terrible. They're all doing terrible things. Let's impeach them all and we'll just start over. Well, the executive says, no, no, no. While their terms are still open, I'm going to appoint the people to finish those terms. Um, so again, it prevents um, the legislature from acting um, improperly. So let's talk about the three different branches specifically. Um, the legislature, now this is what is called um, bicameral, meaning there's two houses. Um, there's a Senate and a House of Representatives. Now this is in Texas. Now, there's also this at the federal level, so it's a little bit confusing. But in Texas, the way our legislature is set up is it is two houses, a Senate and a House of Representatives. There are um, 31 senators and 150 representatives. There are no term limits. They make $7,200 a year, which is not a lot of money. Um, and we can talk pros and cons about that in the next lecture. Um, should they be paid more? Should they be paid less? What are the, the pros and cons of that salary level? They meet once every two years for 140 days in odd number of years, unless there's a special session. And we'll talk about special sessions too. But um, they, um, they only can meet for an, a small amount of time. Senators, state senators, um, serve for four years. They have to be at least 26 years old and a citizen of the United States. They have to have been a resident of Texas for five years and a resident of their district where they are elected from for one year. Now representatives, state representatives, um, serve for two years. 
Um, they have to be at least 21 years old, a citizen of the United States, a resident of Texas for two years, and a resident of their district for at least one year. The legislature um, enacts different laws. Um, in 2019, there were some new laws that were enacted by the legislature. It's kind of showing you exactly um, what they do. Um, there was the Born Alive Act, which said that doctors must treat a baby born alive after a failed attempted abortion, very specific set of circumstances. There was um, Senate Bill 22, which prohibited state and local governments from partnering with agencies that perform abortion, abortions, even if they contract for services not related to the procedure. So that just prevents, um, for example, um, the government of the city of Arlington from partnering with Planned Parenthood, um, even if they're just partnering with Planned Parenthood to offer free mammograms to um, a certain segment of women. Um, the smoking age was raised from 18 to 21. Um, schools must allow people to engage in expressive activities in outdoor common spaces. And telemarketers are banned from using fake numbers. So these are some kinds of things that um, the state legislature addresses and did address in 2019. They provided that um, female prisoners can no longer be shackled if they're pregnant, um, will be screened for trauma, and the Department of Criminal Justice will study the effects of visitation policies on women and their children. Again, very specific law. Um, the driver responsibility program was eliminated. This was a program that um, put an extra cost on top of your penalty that you get um, from a traffic ticket um, for certain traffic offenses, like driving without a license or driving without insurance. And this extra um, money that was, this extra fine that was tacked on top was um, slated to go to um, fund trauma care. Um, Kind of the thinking was that if you're driving without a license and you um, you could potentially be in, in, in a wreck and hurt someone who has to be cared for by the state um, for trauma. So um, this was repealed for a number of reasons, but primarily because it was just piling on because um, it was basically charging you um, twice for the same offense and it was not raising the money that it was it was expected to and so um, it wasn't really performing like it was intended to and it was really just causing some undue hardship so um, patients will not receive surprise medical bills when the provider and insurance company cannot agree on a payment so this means if you um, go to the hospital and you you go for a broken leg and the insurance company says um, well we'll pay the hospital two thousand dollars for the broken leg and the hospital says yeah but um, it cost us ten thousand dollars to fix this broken leg they can't just surprise you're gonna um, get a bill for eight thousand um, dollars you can't get a surprise medical bill if if it, the reason why there's um, a surprise is because the the two insurance company and the provider can't agree on payment um, another very specific law um, in 29 enacted in 2019 um, women can pump breast milk wherever they want um, so again there was a, a segment of the population that really felt strongly about this lobbied their legislative representatives, and there's now a law. And then finally, the, um, the lemonade law. Um, neighborhoods and cities cannot um, regulate or prohibit children from selling non-alcoholic drinks on private property. Again, your kids can have a lemonade stand. Um, now, they can't sell um, Mike's Hard Lemonade, 
they can sell um, just regular lemonade on your property and a city can't say um, that they have to be taxed or prohibit them from doing that. Okay, another law, seller must disclose if a property has flooded in a catastrophic event. So we're looking at you, Houston, who uh, had just had some catastrophic flooding. And um, because of that catastrophic flooding, now there's a law that a seller must disclose if there has been um, flooding on the property. Um, another law that was a, a 2019 legislative act, um, thieves who seal packages will be charged with a class A misdemeanor, meaning up to a year in jail and a $4,000 fine or both, to a third degree felony, which is two to 10 years in prison and up to 10,000 um, dollars in fine or both, um, depending on the number of addresses mail is stolen from. This was probably not a big deal um, in 1875 when the Constitution was written and when the first laws were, were set out. Um, but it is a huge deal now that we get everything delivered to our front doorsteps by Amazon. Um, and then also, um, <laughs> A fairly specific law in Texas is that you can carry an unlicensed handgun the week after a governor declares a natural disaster. So, um, you know, just letting you know that if you need to protect yourself from looters um, after a natural disaster, but you don't have your handgun license, um, you can go ahead and carry your gun. Now, sometimes you'll hear um, a, a proclamation like the governor has declared um, Harris County, uh, uh, that, you know, area of Texas, um, as a natural disaster area. And you wonder like, well, why, why do they have to tell us that yes, half the city is underwater? Why do they have to tell us that it's actually declared a disaster? Um, well, it releases federal funding, it releases state funding, and also it provides that you can now roam around the city with your unlicensed handgun for a week. So these are just some of the laws that legislature, these are kinds of things that the legislature has recently taken up. Now in 2021, there will probably be another set of, of laws that come through. And um, it'll be interesting to see what those laws on the ballot um, say. And I would expect that they probably will reflect some um, pandemic related issues. Now we talked about the legislative branch. This is the second branch, the executive. Now something that's um, important about the executive branch is that it is um, where the governor and, and that whole group um, works. There is not a cabinet. The governor doesn't have a cabinet like the president has a cabinet. No secretary of education that that the governor appoints, things like that, like the like the federal constitution provides. Um, the Texas constitution allows for a plural executive, which just means that sh the power is shared um, and the governor doesn't have really direct power, but this is all you know shared among the whole branch. The executive branch is the governor, the lieutenant governor, the controller of public accounts, commissioner of the general land office, and three Texas Railroad Commissioners. And they all share power um, in the executive branch. And um, we elect them all, of course, because we elect everybody in Texas. But um, these are the people that are, um, so these are the people that hold power in the executive branch. The governor, um, must be at least 30 years old, a citizen of the United States, a resident of Texas for five years, and the governor will serve a four-year term. Now, you remember earlier, I said the governor serves a two-year term. That um, constitution, that constitutional provision was amended by a constitutional amendment, and now the governor serves a four-year term. In fact, everyone in the the executive branch serves four years except for the railroad commissioners who serve six-year terms that stagger. So basically you're not replacing the entire railroad commissioner commission um, at the same time. Okay. 
the governor's appointment power is indirect. And so what does this mean? This means that the governor will appoint a supervisory board and that board will appoint a person, like a director, um, that will then be approved by the Senate. So um, there's not a whole lot of direct appointment power by the governor. Um, the, the governor can fire their staff, but they can't fire someone that's been appointed because, again, the governor didn't directly appoint this person. The, governor, the governor's board that the governor appointed, um, appointed the person, the officer, and that officer was confirmed by the legislature. Um, and the governor cannot fire someone who has been appointed by a previous governor. So if there is an, um, a state, um, state official who was appointed by a previous governor, the, the new governor can't come in and just clean house. Um, the governor has very limited direct power and budget power. We have a very weak governor, and I don't mean weak like Greg Abbott is um, a weak person personally, um, physically, or, or emotionally, or mentally, or anything like that. I just mean the office of governor in Texas um, is so limited that it does not provide for a very strong um, office. Um, the governor's biggest power, arguably, is their veto power. Um, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, um, but the governor can, um, can veto just a certain line in an apportionment bill. So it doesn't have to veto the whole apportionment bill, can just say, yeah, no, we're not spending money on that. Apportionment bills are bills that say where money is going to be spent. So um, the governor can look at a whole apportionment bill saying, you know, a million dollars goes to this organization or this, this um, committee, and a million dollars goes to this um, segment of the government. Now, if the, the governor wants to, they can just veto one of those things, and it doesn't kill the whole bill. Um, the governor has to veto, though, um, a bill within 10 days if the legislature is in session or 20 days after the legislature has left session. So if the legislature um, approves um, a bill and sends it to the governor to sign um, the last day of the session, then the governor has 20 days to um, veto the bill. And if the governor doesn't veto the bill, then the bill is, is becomes a law. Um, some places, some states, provide that the governor has a pocket veto, which just means the governor can ignore the bill and then it never gets signed into law. Um, Texas kind of does it the opposite way, just meaning that it's gonna become a law unless the governor vetoes it. Um, so I hope that makes sense. In Texas, if the governor just says, I'm not signing that, um, then it will still become a law it won't automatically get vetoed. The default is law, not the default is vetoed. Okay, so the third and last branch of government, the judicial branch. Um, in Texas, something special about the judicial branch is we have two courts of final appeal. So we have the Supreme Court and then we have the Court of Criminal Appeals. I really wish they would have named it the Criminal Supreme Court or the Supreme Criminal Court, but it is um, it is the same. It is on the same level as the Texas Supreme Court, the Court of Criminal Appeals. But um, as we'll talk about in our judicial branch lecture, it is for criminal matters, not for civil matters. Um, in Texas. Judges are selected in partisan elections. This is um, super unique to Texas. Um, most states do not elect every single judge like Texas does, and they do not elect them in partisan elections, meaning judges don't run as a Democrat or a Republican. They just run. Um, qualifications are set by the Constitution, so there are tons of different kinds of judges, and there are tons of different qualifications for each of those kinds of judges. Um, trial judges will serve four-year terms, and appellate court judges or appeals court judges will serve six-year terms. 
And if somebody leaves or dies or um, is asked to leave office before the end of their term, the governor appoints someone to finish their terms. Something, again, that is um, going back up, I neglected to say, something that's unique to Texas is that some judges, county judges and justices of the peace, JP court judges, um, are not required to be lawyers. So if you have a case in small claims court and you go see the justice of the peace um, to work out your, your grievance with your next door neighbor for, you know, who has to pay um, the $5 it costs to mow this tiny piece of grass between the two of your houses, um, that person that's hearing your case may or may not be a lawyer, but they will be elected. Um, one um, thing we should talk about is voting. Um, we've talked a lot about voting, um, just because voting is, is on everybody's mind, but also it is um, something that is very, very important. Um, remember that suffrage means the right to vote. So you would be in favor of women's suffrage if you wanted women to have a right to vote. Suffrage, again, as I've said probably, is a terrible, like, misleading word because it makes it sound, if you say, um, yeah, I'm in favor of women's suffrage, it's like, wait a minute, women suffering? No, women getting the right to vote. Um, in Texas, you have to be 18, not convicted of certain felonies, and not found to be mentally incompetent. Um, in Texas, you cannot they, our constitution provides that on the state level, um, there will not be any initiatives, recalls, or propositions that will be on the ballot. Now, you may be thinking, I've voted and I've seen propositions on the ballot and I've seen initiatives on the ballot. Yes, those would be for local um, government. But as far as state government goes, um, there will be no statewide initiatives, recalls, or propositions. Initiatives are um, when citizens place a proposal on the ballot. Um, referendums are um, saying, you know, putting something on the ballot to um, say when a law goes into effect, and a recall is um, saying that um, somebody is going to be kicked out of office before their term um, their term is up. And so, you know, is on a state level, a, an, an organization can't organize um, to get on the ballot um, a provision that we all vote on to say whether Greg Abbott, the governor, can be kicked out of office. And then propositions are... Um, you know, really just kind of um, things that people um, vote on to give their opinion. So um, they're really just um, kind of um, symbolic as far as we want to know what our people in our local government think. Um, they're not on the ballot, again, as, at the state level. Um, voters in Texas can ratify constitutional amendments, determine whether we're going to have an income tax. Currently, we do not. Um, we are one of the very few states that do not have an income tax, and that is a, a big um, financial advantage to living in Texas. We have a federal income tax, but we do not have an additional state income tax. And um, voters also set legislative salaries. So not only do, do we decide um, who is going to be hired as a legislature, but we also set their salaries and determine if they get a raise or not. Now we're going to talk a tiny bit about schools um, and kind of the provisions, the constitutional um, provisions that um, surround schools. The Texas Constitution um, says that it shall be the duty of the legislature of the state to establish and make suitable provision for the support and maintenance of an efficient system of free public schools. Um, actually, it says free public education, but um, what 
that says is that it is um, the legislature must have an efficient system of free public education. Um, what does that mean? It means a lot of things. Um, and there was a recent, um, I feel like fairly recent Supreme Court, I mean, um, Texas Supreme Court case, Edgeward versus Kirby, 1989, that says that uneven spending is not suitable and efficient. So the um, state has to spend the same amount per student on all different schools. Um, and that's, that's what it means in Texas to have an efficient system of free public schools. The Texas Constitution says that local governments um, have power, county governments have power, and um, they are subordinate to the state, meaning the state can tell the county governments what to do, um, and that um, the states can, I mean, the counties um, and local governments can then be um, established from from there, like we talked about with a document um, that is, you know, different than the Constitution. It cannot be, um, it cannot be in contradiction of the Constitution, the, the Texas or the federal, but um, it can just be a document that talks about um, the local government. But the county government is mentioned um, in the Constitution as having power. Um, also, the county can um, have special districts um, with um, power in distinct areas. So we've talked about that, those special districts like a hospital district or an independent school district. And the federal constitution allows um, local governments to set up those special kind of districts that can, can govern themselves. Now, how do we amend? Um, the Texas Constitution, one of those 498 amendments that we have, um, two thirds of the legislatures must oppose, what must propose, sorry, um, and a majority of voters voting must approve. So once you get the legislative um, branch of the Texas government to propose um, that a constitutional amendment be on the ballot, then a majority of voters voting must approve. Not a majority of voters registered, not a majority of voters eligible, just of the ballots cast, a majority, 51 of those, if there's 100 or 51%, um, must approve. Most constitutional amendments pass because once they get the support of the legislatures, um, they are probably going to get a support of a majority of the voters. Um, also, most constitutional amendments are on the ballot in odd years, um, so they're not going to be on the ballot in um, an election like 2020. Um, I didn't see any constitutional amendments on the ballot in 2020, and why would that be? It would be because um, odd-numbered year turnout is significantly lower. Um, so we're not talking mid-year um, or midterm elections, which would be um, 2022. That's a midterm election because it's in the middle of the presidential um, term and that's when we would elect our governor. Um, we're talking like 2021, how many people are gonna vote? Um, based on the two different bar graphs you see on this slide, it's going to be a lot fewer people that are going to vote in an odd year. Um, and that way, it's going to be easier to pass, um, pass a constitutional amendment. You're going to be able to get just the, just the educated voters probably um, out voting, and you're going to be able to um, probably get them to pass the constitutional amendment. So that is it for um, our Texas Constitution, Unit 3, Lesson 1. And um, now the rest of the unit we're going to go through and talk about 
the um, legislative, the judicial, and the executive branches of the state of Texas.